All right, it's 10 o'clock, so let's get started. And I want to say thank you to everybody for taking the time this morning to tune in. So first thing, if everybody that's online can please mute their microphones, mute their phones, uh, so there's not any other background noise, that would be appreciated. And if you have any questions as I go along, just type into the chat, and I'll try to notice the question and um, answer that as we go. So let's get started. So today's topic is the benefits of adding a temperature sensor to a steam boiler. So, the basics. If, every, if everybody could please mute their microphones, I get feedback if you don't. So I'll give everybody a second to do that. Thanks. So the basics. You want to protect the boiler, and the boiler is the pressure vessel that allows conversion of energy from a burner firing into a furnace in a hot water or steam. So while the material is typically carbon steel, it could also be other materials such as stainless, cast iron, cast aluminum, or some other alloy. But regardless of the material used, the manufacturer of the boiler vessel will have instructions uh, regarding how to properly fire into their furnace so that you can prevent and delay metal fatigue, which would eventually happen, but you want to prevent that for as long as possible. It is possible to get well over 50 years of service from a carbon steel boiler if the main sources of corrosion and damage, which would be thermal stress, oxygen, and there are other things, but if those can be avoided. So what is thermal stress? The simple answer is that thermal stress is the mechanical stress caused by any change in temperature of a material. You can see this with ice cubes when you put a cold ice cube in hot water, the ice cube cracks. But with a gradual change in temperature, material will expand and contract in size at a uniform rate and the stresses will be minimized. If there's a large differential, in temperature between the surfaces of a material and the center, there will be a lot of stress in the material that can cause fractures in the material on the outside. As these fractures accumulate over time, this can result in failures. As a boiler is usually under a lot of pressure, these failures um, have the potential to be catastrophic. So we'll go over a couple basic and primitive uh, designs here, primitive uh, drawings anyway. So this is a fire tube. One of the main boiler designs is the fire tube, and in the fire tube, the burner fires into a furnace that is surrounded by water. The flue gases are drawn to the exhaust outlet in tubes, and the tubes make multiple passes through the water to scrub as much heat out as possible. So again, this is a basic drawing of what it looks like, and shown here is a would be a three pass. It would come through the furnace, or come out of the burner into the furnace, it would pass once, go back, and back again to the flue. And around it is going to be the water that's going to take the heat out of the flue gas. As the difference in temperature between the water and the furnace increases, more thermal stress is introduced. The material used dictates how much of a problem this may be and what control strategies can be used to mitigate the stress. Then another type is a water tube. Again, this is a basic drawing. But in the water tube, the water is contained in tubes that pass through the furnace. And due to this design, the tubes can flex to displace some of the thermal stress. Water tubes also do not hold nearly as much water, uh, but the upside is they can operate at a much higher pressure. So again, with either type of design, or even if it's a different design, you're going to follow the manufacturer's recommendation when it comes to thermal stress. In a hot water boiler, the vessel is completely filled with water and pumps are used to provide circulation. So preventing thermal stress in a hot water boiler requires to monitor the water temperature and restrict the firing rate or output as appropriate. You can use mixing or diverting valves to increase the temperature of the incoming water by recirculating some of it back into the inlet and use that to keep the temperature up. In a steam boiler, the vessel is only partially filled with water. Steam is generated above the water line and the steam pressure provides the means to use the steam. Preventing thermal stress in a steam boiler is not as simple as monitoring the steam pressure and restricting the firing rate. But instead you want to, of monitoring the steam pressure, it's very important to monitor the water temperature below the water line to get a true indication of the potential for thermal stress. Incoming water can also be preheated with different methods such as economizers, deaerators, or other means. This allows the water to turn to steam quicker, which not only reduces thermal stress, but would also improve overall system efficiency. So there is a correlation between the steam pressure and the water temperature in a boiler. As the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit, this is what water temperature should be when the steam pressure is starting to increase, or right when it's at zero bar or zero PSI. As the gauge pressure increases, the water temperature will also increase at a known rate. The table at the 
the table's on the next slide. The table on the next slide shows the temperature for different pressure readings. For example, the water temperature of a boiler at 100 PSI or 6.89 bar should be approximately 170 Celsius or 338 Fahrenheit. And this shows uh, the saturated steam table. It shows the correlation from a PSI or a bar to a degrees Fahrenheit or a degrees Celsius reading. So when you connect multiple boilers to a common steam header, it is common to include a non-return valve between the boiler steam outlet and the header. It's a mechanical valve that only allows steam into the header when the boiler steam pressure exceeds the header pressure. The amount it opens is proportional to the pressure differential. And if the header pressure is higher, the valve remains closed. So in this drawing, you see the header is got the non-return valve in between the header and the boiler. If the boiler pressure is higher, then the header pressure, it will push this open on a little bit, will come through. If the header pressure is higher, it will keep the non-return valve closed. It's basically a check valve. So why not use pressure and just calculate the temperature? Well, the first thing to note is that the formula to calculate the temperature from the steam pressure is not a linear formula, it is a logarithmic formula. So it's, it's more complicated than that. And even so, using a linear equation could result in a value that was close enough but there's a much more important reason why it's bad practice to rely on the pressure instead of reading the temperature. The first big issue is that if there is no pressure, the temperature can only be assumed to be under 100 degrees or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but it can't actually be measured. And the second and biggest issue is that it is fairly common for a non-return valve in a steam system to leak pressure from the header into the boiler. As it does so, the area above the water line will eventually pressurize to be equal to that of the header. And while this area does have steam and is under pressure, the water in the vessel does not have the temperature that corresponds to that steam uh, pressure being measured. The water could actually be any temperature. Without a temperature sensor, the proper control method can't be utilized to prevent thermal stress. So here's an example with two boilers running. Both boilers are running and everything is working properly. The header in this case is 6.89 bar, 100 PSI, and the boilers are the same pressure and the temperatures are corresponding 170 Celsius or 338 Fahrenheit. That is the pressure or the temperature that corresponds to that pressure. Everything's working properly. Now with only one boiler needed, everything working properly, boiler one is running and it's producing the 6.89 bar or 100 PSI and that's going into the header. The non-return valve is keeping the steam out of boiler two, which is not making any steam and is cold since it has been off for several days. So it has no pressure and the water temperature is only 28 Celsius, 83 Fahrenheit. So everything's working properly. This boiler is off and cold and the other boiler is running. So here's an example of only one boiler is needed but the non-return valve is leaking. So in this, as in the last slide, boiler one is running and producing 6.89 bar or 100 PSI, which is going into the header, but the non-return valve is leaking steam in the boiler too which is not making any steam of its own, and it's also cold since it's been off for several days. So you see the steam side of boiler two is at 100 PSI eventually from the, from the leaking steam. So you'll, re you'll read 100 PSI on the gauge, but the temperature in the vessel itself is only 83 degrees Fahrenheit or 28 degrees Celsius because it's leaking. So control methods. Low fire hold, one of the most basic control methods is to use a temperature stat below the water line to release the burner to modulate. So this is a simple on-off switching that restricts any modulation until the temperature reaches a certain set point. A commonly recommended set point by a boiler manufacturer for this function would be 60 Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. The wiring for this method can be either to interrupt the modulation signal using a relay if the, if the control doesn't create an error when you cut off the 4 to 20 signal or you can utilize a dedicated low fire hold digital input if you have one. Either of these methods are controlled using the temperature stat that you install. A burner logic's flame safeguard and all Nexus parallel positioning controls do have an input that you can use for this purpose. Another method, and this is thermal shock or warming, another method involves checking the temperature upon startup. Depending upon the setup options chosen, modulation will be restricted by temperature or will gradually increase in steps as the temperature increases. All the Nexus parallel positioning controls offer this feature using an analog temperature transmitter. These transmitters are offered in the measurement range from 0 Celsius to 400 Celsius, or 32 to 752 Fahrenheit, to cover all the range encountered in a steam application. 
This function is, is referred to as thermal shock in the NXF4000 and PPC4000 or as warming in the NX6100 and PPC6000. Thermal shock, one of the methods you can use is via temperature hold. And so using this method, a set point is selected that will allow modulation to begin. At any temperature below that set point, the burner will modulate only at the selected firing rate. Note that this only works in one direction. So once the set point has been exceeded after startup, the if the temperature were to slightly fall below again, the burner would not go back to low fire as it would with a simple low fire hold. So this is for startup. When you exceed your, your temperature, it releases it to modulate. And here's an example of thermal shock via temperature hold uh, on the graph. So in this case, we have our thermal exit set at 48.9 Celsius or 120 Fahrenheit with a minimum low fire of 20%. So that minimum low fire equals 20% is the firing rate that we're running at when we're in our thermal shock protection mode. And our normal set point is 100 PSI, 6.89 bar. And if you remember, set point one being 100 PSI would equate to 338 degrees Fahrenheit, so keep that in mind. So when the burner starts, it's measuring the water temperature and it's going to start low. So let's say we started at about 80 or 90. It's going to modulate only at 20 percent. It's going to measure that water temperature. It's going to keep modulating at 20 percent until it hits that thermal exit set point of 120 Fahrenheit, at which point it will be released to modulate and it will go to high fire at that point because we're only measuring 120 degrees and with our set point of 100 that we're going to require all the way up to 338. So we're a long ways from hitting our set point. So that's why it goes straight to high fire. The next method is thermal shock via segmentation. And this addresses that issue with going straight from the low fire to the high fire position. So using this method, a set point is selected that will allow modulation to begin. And this is the start set point. Between this set point and the stop set point, modulation will be divided into 16 steps. And I do have a graph on the next slide to show. The steps will begin at the minimum firing rate you select and then we'll end it th with high fire. As the temperature for each step is satisfied, modulation will proceed to the next step. A maximum time for each step can also be entered, so the overall time that you'll spend in the thermal shock mode can be limited, so you're not stuck that way all day. Note that once modulation has moved to the next step, it will not go backwards even if the temperature temporarily drops, so it only increases, same as, as the last method. So it's got a couple more parameters, but you can see how it works. So we're going to have a start point, and in this case 120, and an exit of 200. We're going to have a minimum low fire 20%. That's where it's going to start, just as with the last method. Timed override of two minutes. That's how long it will spend in each step at a maximum. If, if it gets to the next temperature threshold, it will move to the next step earlier than that. And we still have the set point of 100 PSI. So in this case, when we light off and we, we start out at 80 degrees, we modulate at 20% until we hit the thermal start. Now, thermal the, the function will have divided it into 16 steps, as you see here, between the start and the exit, and between your minimum firing rate and high fire. And so we don't know exactly what the set point of this is, but it's somewhere between 120 and 130. It's probably exactly 125 because I picked an easy division just for the example. It, once it hits 125, it'll move to the next step and the next step, etc. So it'll gradually increase the firing rate, which is a lot more gentle on the vessel. And it will only stay at any one step for two minutes. So in this case, it would be a maximum of 32 minutes in thermal shock. So another function you can use with a temperature sensor is called hot standby. And hot standby is a function of a lead lag scheme. So the concept is that the boiler is kept hot while it is in standby to the system. This is so that the boiler is kept ready to produce usable steam quickly when it is needed again. Without a lead lag scheme, the idea of hot standby doesn't make sense. In fact, it's not possible. So suppose the need is to keep a boiler with a 6.89 bar or 100 PSI set point at 148.9 or 300 degrees Fahrenheit when it is in standby. So that, that temperature corresponds to approximately 3.59 bar or 52 PSI on the steam table. This correlation between temperature and pressure is often overlooked when trying to understand the concept of hot standby. Looking at it from the perspective of pressure, if the reading was 3.59 bar, 52 PSI, the boiler would be running anyway because it is well under the 100 PSI set point of the system. So here's some hot standby logic. Uh, the hot standby can be physically implemented in wiring as shown using relays and a temperature stat. 
The relays can be controlled by building automation, a lead lag control, or by an operator as needed, but some, something has to control these, uh, this switchover. With the Nexus parallel positioning controls, these functions are handled in logic and don't need to be physically wired. So coming from the limit string, um, and we, I, I have a couple in the next slides, a couple of um, pass through the limits here, so well, I'll move on to that. So here the boiler is needed, so the pressure sensor is used. So right now we, we have a set point of 100 PSI and our pressure is 90. So we are, our limits are complete because our pressure is under the set point. And the boiler is needed, so we go through the limit string and it's needed so it goes through the pressure stat to the limits complete. Now if I go back, I, this is what I didn't explain. The way that the hot standby is going to work here is you're going to choose if you want to use the temperature or the pressure basically by deciding if it's needed or not needed and it's going to divert the limit string one way or the other and if it's on the not needed path you have to decide if you want to keep it warm so that's what I forgot to explain but this is the normal situation the boiler is needed the limits are complete it passes through the needed side through the pressure stat to limits complete so the boiler is needed, so the pressure sensor is used, but in this particular case, our set point is 100 PSI, but our pressure is 110, we're over set point. Our limits are open since the pressure is greater than the set point. We pass from the limits through the needed side, it hits the pressure stat, and that's where it stops. So that's just a normal shutdown uh, because we've satisfied our limits. Here's a situation where the boiler is not needed, it's in standby. Um, but, but warm standby or hot standby is enabled, so the temperature sensor is used. The set point is 100 PSI, but the actual system pressure is 20. But since we're in standby mode, that doesn't really matter in our case. Our standby set point is 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and our temperature is only 260 degrees Fahrenheit. So our limits on the temperature side are complete since the temperature is less than the standby set point. So as we come from the other limits, we pass through the not needed side. We do want to keep warm. We have not satisfied our temperature, so the limits are complete. So the burner will fire to maintain the standby temperature in this case. So here's the same thing, except now we've reached our temperature. Boiler is still not needed, so it goes through the not needed path. We do want to keep it warm, but our standby temperature is 316 degrees, but our standby set point is only 300. So now it stays off. And as long as the temperature stays above 300, it'll stay off. If it drops below 300, it'll turn on from the temperature stat. If it needs to be called back as needed, back to be lead boiler, for example, then it'll divert down to the pressure stat again, and we'll turn on from that. Now keep in mind that anytime the temperature stat's on, the pressure stat is also on, because your temperature is always gonna be less than your pressure. Because if you're, you're 100 PSI set point, that equates to 338. You're not going to set your standby temperature to higher than that. So adding a temperature sensor to your steam boiler is a very inexpensive way to help ensure that damage to a boiler from thermal stress is minimized or eliminated. Trying to achieve the same functionality using just steam pressure would be an alternative in a perfect world, but the reality is that something as simple and common as a leaking non-return valve can easily end up costing a lot in boiler repair down the line. So the best policy is always to try to use the right tool for the job, in this case, the temperature sensor. So adding a temperature sensor to an existing installation is easy as well. And all FireEye Nexus parallel position controls support enabling the relevant thermal shock or hot standby features as needed. The best thing to do if you can is to specify the temperature transmitter when you do the install because that's the best time to do it before the water is in the boiler, obviously. So if anybody has any questions, type them in the chat and I'll try to answer that. Um, and if not, thanks for tuning in, everybody, and hopefully we'll see you next week.